Today we are discussing symbolic interaction for CAS 303. I am going to do my best uh, to rifle through this PowerPoint lecture because there are a few additional uh, website links below um, with material that I'd like you to view as well. Uh, so make sure that you view all of the clips I'm asking you to view. Uh, and there's one article I just kind of want you to glance over. You don't have to read the whole article, uh, but just sort of as an example um, where we sort of see some of the confusion with regard to symbolic interaction uh, as well as context. So we're going to start off uh, discussing symbolic interaction by first sort of looking at a case study with regard to uh, the ballet Swan Lake. Down below is your first uh, YouTube clip. I have a 30 minute lecture in another class uh, where I specifically discuss the idea of uh, Swan Lake and how it is uh, of interest um, specifically because the two uh, lead characters are played by the same ballerina. Uh, this is a very sort of old concept um, in literature uh, and different sort of in, in movies, right? All of a sudden you get to the end of the movie and you find out that the, you know, person who's fighting with themselves, it ends up being like the same person the whole time, right? It's just sort of a figment of the imagination. Um, so uh, that's not the same as Swan Lake. Swan Lake is two separate characters, um, but they're both played by the same ballerina. So it leaves the audience with a bit of sort of uh, things, uh, some, some ideas to wrestle with with regard to, you know, what does it mean? Um, so go ahead and watch the, the, the clip on Swan Lake below. Um, but the big thing that, you know, the big question to take away is, you know, how might an audience reflect on this idea of the same character playing two different people? And sort of struggling over this idea of how that person is supposed to interact with the other characters based on whether it's played by the white swan or the black swan. So this is a good evil dichotomy uh, situation. So go ahead and check that down below. All right. The big thing you need to know for this entire uh, section today is symbolic interaction, right? Um, and this is from the textbook that you do not have to purchase this semester, right? But it's a frame of reference for understanding how humans in concert with one another create symbolic worlds and how these worlds in turn shape, our, uh, shape human behavior. What this means is that the way in which you go about behaving in the world is influenced by all the people around you, right? Uh, so the way in which you interact with your parents is different than the way you interact with your friends is different than the way you interact with your, uh, with your teachers. And not only is my behavior shifted, but sort of the symbols we use or the language we use um, can also shift, right? So you might be an entirely different communicative person uh, based on the individual that you're talking to, all right? Based on the person that you're interacting with. So this is what symbolic interaction really gets at is sort of how, how, does our, how do our communication strategies change and shift uh, based on the context that we're in. Uh, so this started to develop in the early 20th century. You can look through um, some of these important individuals, if you like, University of Chicago, University of Iowa. But the big thing is um, we're talking about this guy named Kuhn, who used a, a quantitative approach um, as well as a qualitative approach to sort of look at how people describe themselves. So sometimes we want to sort of we want to describe ourselves as one thing, right? Uh, but Kuhn said, you know what? I think people have different understandings of who they are based on the context that they're in. So what he started to do instead of, you know, just, just tell me a little bit about yourself. What he did is he had people um, write 20 statements about themselves, right? And they just had to continually answer this question of who am I, right? And the more you think about who you are, the more you realize that the behaviors that you elicit the characteristics you have, the personality that comes out, is dependent on those individuals around you. So if this individual came to me or, you know, you're in a classroom setting and someone says, you know, who am I? They're probably most likely going to talk about their academic accolades, um, what their major is. They're going to talk about themselves in the context of sort of their, their intellectual abilities as well as their intellectual pursuits. But if you continue to ask this question more often, um, you say, who are you, who are you, who are you? Now some people start reaching for things like, well, I guess outside the classroom, I'm a, a son or a daughter. I'm a brother or a sister. I'm a friend. Uh, I'm a romantic partner to someone. And then people start sort of understanding that based on who they're in connection with, their attitude, their characteristics, and their personality is changing, right? 
Um, and so that's what, you know, Kuhn and others were getting at with this idea of, you know, symbolic interactions. The definitions we have with our, about ourselves are constantly shifting based on the context that we're in. Okay, so people are motivated to act based on the meanings assigned to people, play, uh, excuse me, people, things, and, uh, and events. Um, I act this way because the context that are, is around me dictates that I act this way. So again, you act differently in the classroom than you do at home with your friends or when you're playing video games or with your family. Um, I act differently, certainly, right, when it comes to uh, you know, these, these Zoom lectures when I'm a professor, but you know, at three o'clock every day, I go to a high school and I'm a wrestling coach. Um, you know, I act differently with friends, romantic partners. Um, when my mom calls me, right, it's like, you know, I'm almost 37 years old. And when my mom calls me, I still sort of retreat back into being this like, you know, kid, right, to, um, to a mother, right? So this is what we all sort of have to recognize. All right, so the importance of meaning in human behavior. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of self-concept, so how do we think about ourselves, uh, as well as the individual, or excuse me, the relationship we have between ourselves and the society around us. All right, so as I've discussed already, right, you uh, act based on the meanings that others have for you. So there's an expectation when you come in the classroom with regard to how you are going to act, and you act in accordance with that. So as much as we want to go around and say, I'm an individual, I'm an adult, I do what I want. The thing is that we all fall into patterns based on the context of the situation, right? So you can be like too cool for school, you can be the most, you know, rebel personality. When you walk into a classroom, you find a desk, you sit down, you act respectfully, you raise your hand to talk, right? We all fall into these patterns based on the, the context that we find ourselves in, based on the people that we're interacting with, right? Again, you can be a big rebel and say, no one can control me. But if, you know, you're interacting with a boss or a teacher or a person in position of authority um, who has a lot of say over sort of, you know, if you're passing a class or getting a paycheck, uh, we all fall into patterns with regard to, um, you know, respectful norms. OK, so keep that in mind. Meaning is created between the interaction of two people. So you can't have a meaning for a word unless another person is involved. So a person has to be able to decode that meaning. All right. So. We've talked about this before. Um, yeah, words, context, uh, symbols, all of those things are community, right? They're all based on a community of people coming together and having a shared understanding for what those words and, and symbols signify, right? So that shared meaning is important with regard to uh, sort of um, being able to put meaning onto the, the objects and ideas uh, that are in our worlds. Meaning is modified through an interpretive process. So we're going to get to the next slide. Little, next slide. I believe it's the next slide. A little jarring. Just be prepared. All right. But the interpretive process, um, the, the modification means what we're talking about is like words and symbols and ideas. Like these things can change. Or a word that you use might have a slightly different, different definition than, than, um, than when I use the word. And so this is when we create miscommunication. Right. And this is also when we run into things like um, we run into these hard, you know, cultural conversations about whether or not certain words cause offense. Right. So when people say, you know, if, if I use a phrase and you say that that phrase is offend you and I say, well, where I grew up or the context in which I grew up, that that phrase wasn't offensive. Interpretations um, are modified, right, depending on where you live, depending on who you are. Right. Um, some things are offensive and th some things aren't. And it's, and it's more complicated. I know that the sort of easy go-to um, diversity one-on-one -on -one training things will say like, well, the person who was offended is the one who sort of gets control over the situation. Um, they get to decide whether or not they're offended. So if they're offended, you know, don't use those words anymore. It's more complicated than that. Um, you should be polite, right? If someone asks you to, you know, avoid using certain words or phrases because, you know, and, and you're in like a work environment or a classroom environment with them, I would say, you know, err on the side of just like, you know, trying to be polite. Don't keep, you know, prodding people because, you, you know, you want to be a jerk. Uh, but it's far more complicated with regard to words and phrases can have drastically different meanings to individuals um, based on uh, where they grew up, how they grew up, the people they grew up around, all right? 
words are modified, symbols are modified. And again, hold on, because I think the next slide is the jarring one. I was correct. All right. So this is obviously jarring. All right. Um, it, you know, it's usually a slower reveal in the classroom, but we don't have that kind of situation. Okay. So here's the thing is that we debate over what certain words and symbols mean all the time. So obviously we know what this symbol is, a Nazi swastika, right? However, there's a recognition that this is a symbol that has been modified specifically in the last uh, almost 100 years, we're around like, you know, 90, 80, 90 years, right, since World War II. So only in the last 80, 90 years, which isn't that long of a timeline in human history, specifically with regard to how this symbol has been used, or at least how a version, we'll call a version of this symbol has been used um, throughout human history. So this symbol that we now know as a, as a Nazi swastika, and it's obviously probably the most um, hate-filled symbol there, there might be. Uh, I can't think of a symbol off the top of my head that would be more hateful. I can think of a lot of hateful words, but symbols, this is a symbol you're going to run far away from if you see somebody uh, in possession of it, right? However, this is a symbol that's been used for thousands of years in various cultures. So this is a Native American moccasin, all right? Um, and this is uh, the Hindu god Ganesh. Um, so uh, the, the, the Hindu god with an elephant head, all right? Uh, so um, in Hinduism and certain, uh, um, yeah, certain parts of Southeast Asia, Buddhism, et cetera, you travel around there, you're going to go into shops and stores and you're going to see swastikas as, um, as jewelry. Um, I've seen some on t-shirts. Um, when I was in Malaysia for the first time about 15 years ago, I remember walking into this like, you know, little shop and they had all these little, um, symbols on carved onto rocks and one was a swastika. And I was like, and it was an, it was like a necklace. And I was like, who's wearing this necklace? My friend had to explain it to me. Right. It was from Malaysia. All right. But you walk around and you, you, you'll see this right in various places around the world. Um, obviously in the United States and in Europe, this is, you know, no, <laughs> don't put this on anything. All right. However, it is a good example of how symbols and meanings change based on context and how different people with different histories have different relationships to this symbol. All right. This is a, a long standing sort of religious symbol in lots of places around the world. Um, and there are some articles you can look up um, where there are uh, specifically South um, Southeast Asian communities in the United States who are trying to reclaim this because it is such an important symbol to various uh, religious practices that come out of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so two articles, or excuse me, one article I'm going to put down below. So you have the Swan Lake you need to watch. And then you can check out this article. This article is from Inside Higher Ed. And it was there was this uh, on campus conflict between um, uh, with a with a student who I had a picture of a swastika after that student had gotten back from, um, I cannot remember what country at the moment, um, but it was a Southeast Asian country. Um, and he sort of had it in his dorm room and it was more dressed up like this, right? Uh, so it's sort of more obviously not the Nazi version of the swastika. Um, and he got in trouble for it. And there was this big sort of back and forth between him and administration uh, with regard to whether or not he should or shouldn't be sanctioned and, you know, how to deal with this sort of um, this, the, the, the fact that different cultures uh, sort of use this sim symbol differently. All right. Um, this is always the problem with censorship. And, you know, so, you know, if a campus wants to come in and says, like, you can never use this symbol or a version of this symbol. Right. Um, so, again, we recognize that this not that the Nazi symbol is slightly different than the Hindu symbol, which is slightly different than this Native American symbol on a moccasin. Right. Um, but part of the problem with censorship is that language and symbols, they change, meanings evolve. Uh, and based on the cultural context, meanings are going to be different. Um, so that's always a problem with censorship. As soon as you say, I'm going to censor that word, well, meanings are just kind of changing on down the road. Uh, there's a really good video of this that I show in one of my other classes uh, from this linguist out of Columbia. His name's John McWhorter. Um, you should check out his, uh, he has, he gives like an hour long speech. I'm only asking you to watch the first 13 minutes of it. Um, and he gives some good examples of how language has evolved. Uh, specifically in here, he uses uh, some examples of uh, Shakespearean work, and he talks about why it is that Shakespeare is difficult to read 500 years later, um, why there's a lot of, you know, high school and college students who are like, we don't want to read Shakespeare. It's old, it's boring, it's hard to read. And his 
point in this is like part of the reason that Shakespeare is hard to read 500 years later, right, since it was first written, is because certain words have changed and evolved just enough to cause these awkward breaks in our minds. Like we, you can't just read Shakespeare and kind of get through it. It's like every seventh or eighth word, like you're going to hit a word and you're like, that's not quite exactly what Shakespeare originally meant, but the word's meaning has changed. And therefore I got to do a little bit of thinking to figure out what did he actually mean in the context of this passage. So these small little words change meaning and that makes the, the reading not go very smooth. All right, it's a little bit clunky. There's these little speed bumps, if you will, in the reading where, you know, reading that's written today, um, you know, if you go to, a, you know, a, a, a bookstore and buy like a new like crime novel, it's like I know people who breeze through a 400 page crime novel in an afternoon because it's written in the language of 2021. All right. So the author is sort of speaking the same language as we are, where Shakespeare, right, was, you know, speaking a different language than us. It's, it's English, right? But the words are slightly different in their meaning. So it's a little bit hard to get through. Um, so go ahead and watch Swan Lake, watch this C-SPAN clip with John McWhorter, and then just sort of check out this article from Inside Higher Ed. Those are the three additional things I'm asking you to do today. All right, meanings evolve. Um, so there's two words here. Um, they're probably uh, they're, they're still, they can still both be offensive depending on the context, but they're probably the least offensive of words that have very drastic meanings. So the first is retard, right? We've changed the stress that we put on it, right? But you think about like flame retardant or fire retardant. Um, these are words that are still used. You might even see this word like on the highway when you talk about um, brakes, like don't use brake retardants, right? With regard to uh, certain road conditions, um, specifically when talking about like big rig semi trucks, all right? Um, but what retard means is to delay or to hold back in terms of progress, development, or accomplishment, right? So again, um, flame retardant, right? Not offering this class this semester would, you know, retarded my graduation plans. Like it held back my graduation plans, right? Now, it's obvious, right? The word retard, which is pronounced differently, spelled the same, right? Um, you probably hear the same thing, right? Um, it became a slur directed towards people, right? And this is where it kind of usually stands. Like not many people are gonna use the word retard um, in a, in, you know, everyday culture without getting called out for it. All right. So it did become a story, like the word and the meaning changed, um, because people are jerks. <laughs> All right. There's no other, no other way to put it. Okay. Um, so that meaning evolved and it changed. All right. Uh, the word queer has also changed. Uh, the word queer, we've kind of seen it circle back though. So at first it just meant strange or odd. So if you go into like you know, old music or old poetry, right? They might use the word queer a lot, right? But they don't, it has nothing to do with sexuality. It sort of means like, yeah, things a little bit off here, right? Now, because of that, we can see how it would evolve into a slur for homosexual men, right? But fortunately, I think we could say fortunately, it didn't stay there very long, right? So very quickly, um, Homosexual men, as well as people who, you know, ad, you know, were, were, were allies and advocates, um, they quickly moved towards a positive connotation where to the point now, you know, in higher ed, for instance, uh, it's sort of taken back and we even have like subsets of academia, you know, around what's known as queer theory, right? Um, so you think like LGBT, you know, Q, right? Like people identify as queer with regard to sexuality. Um, so this is a word that sort of changed and evolved. Uh, where it meant something completely that has nothing to do with one's sexuality. It becomes a slur for sexuality, but then very quickly some people are like, no, like we're going to change this into like a positive thing and sort of embrace it. And, you know, people either identify as queer with regard to sexuality or we even have this whole entire field of study known as queer theory, right? So another word where it's sort of changed the meaning a lot. Um, hate speech, we talk about in some other classes, but the the long and short of it is Hate speech is di always difficult to put your finger on. People will go around and say, we don't, we, we dislike hate speech. We don't want to hear hate speech. The problem is, is who gets to define it? And then who gets to go around and decide that one thing is hateful and something else isn't hateful? Um, it's always a problem with definition and context. So as much as people want to say, like, we don't want hateful speech said in polite society, or, you know, if um, you're on college campus and someone says something hateful, you want to be able to you know, report it to an administrator with this bias report system. 
The problem always is this idea of language is sloppy, uh, language needs context, language evolves. So it's, you, you can't lead, like, you, it's hard to give me a precise definition of what hate speech is when it comes to um, writing it down on paper. Now you could say like anything that, you know, degrades people based on, and then you list all the categories, race, gender, sexual orientation, um, uh, veteran status, class status, you know, religious status, et cetera, right? But then you get into context questions, right? With regard to, well, um, is someone of, uh, if, you know, if I'm making fun of religion, if I am that religion, am I, am I allowed to make a joke about my religion? Uh, if I am of a certain race or, um, you know, sexuality or gender background, can I um, talk about, you know, can I, can I make jokes about that? Can I, um, you know, denigrate communities I belong to, but someone else can't, okay? Um, then there comes an issue of, like, if I have, like, actual disagreement. So if you think specifically around religion, which is um, an ideological concept as opposed to an immutable characteristic, something like race is immutable, you can't change it. Religion is a set of ideologies and beliefs. If I disagree with those ideologies and beliefs, or if I'm an atheist, why shouldn't I be able to say, you know, I don't think that your beliefs are correct, and here's all the ways that I think your beliefs are ridiculous, all right? Um, so that always becomes a problem with hate speech is you, you eventually just have to have one person who's the arbiter of meaning. And again, meaning is has to do in this larger community of people who speak that language and it's constantly changing it's constantly evolving okay importance of self-concept um you generally do have a perception about yourself right but again it's influenced with uh with regard to your interactions um towards other individuals and other individuals help you to modify and model your behavior um so for instance, you know, young boys and young girls, they look up to role models and say, I want to be like those individuals. And then all of a sudden they sort of like model their behavior after those individuals. Um, if you want to be, you know, if, if you were an athlete, you know, you might've had a poster of like, you know, when I was growing up, it was like Michael Jordan. When you were growing up, maybe it was LeBron James, right? Um, or Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes or whoever, right? It's like, there's ways in which you sort of say like, that's how I want to be. I want to be a good athlete. I want to be a good, um, I want to be a good musician. Um, I want to, you know, lift a lot of weights. Um, I want to have certain fashion sense, right? And you start sort of modeling your behavior after people who are like the person that you would like to become. Uh, with regard to self-concept, it's a pretty good idea with regard to what's known as the looking glass, right? Um, here's like, you know, we'll call this person Joe. And Joe kind of says, okay, like, how does my dad see me, right? And his dad sees him very differently than his ex-girlfriend over here, right? So the ways in which you feel about yourself is in interaction to other people. Um, so there's people who think that you're the you know, greatest thing in the world and you have this great confidence when you are thinking about yourself in the context of your relationship with that person. There are people who absolutely hate you, right? And you might have a very um, bad, you might have a very bad self uh, concept or bad self-esteem when you think about that individual because you recognize that that individual um, sees flaws in you that other people don't. Uh, the book we're going to read for class next time, make sure you get the handout done, is The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, um, written in 1915. Um, I'm not going to give too much away because I obviously are going to read it and discuss it on, uh, on Friday, uh, but just because it's going on YouTube and people might kind of go back and check it out. Um, and might want to use it for, for notes for the test or something. What we have is this guy named Gregor Samsa. Uh, he wakes up and he discovers that he's transformed into an insect. All right. Um, he's just like, he's a life-size insect. Um, the whole point of this book, Metamorphosis, is Kafka's trying to get is like, what does this mean? And there's a lot of different interpretations, right? One interpretation is that um, Samsa took a lot of pride in the fact that he was the family's income earner while he was a human he was the one who was supporting his family while you know his mom his dad and his sister were you know kind of struggling along so all of a sudden this idea of like being a provider is taken away from him and now he's sort of become a parasite like he, like people have to take care of him because he's an insect he can't do anything for himself right so you know he loses his job you know his dad has to go back to work um, he can't help out at all, right? And so this is like an interesting, if we think about it like as a metaphor, um, as opposed to a literal insight, like this, this idea of like 
we we're all in different we we will move through different points in our life where we are the people who are very helpful and then all of a sudden we might have to shift towards being those individuals who need a lot of help and that can do a lot to one's self esteem right imagine you know imagine a father who's a provider and then all of a sudden that you know something he he gets ill he you know he um he has an accident at work all of a sudden he's 55 years old and you know his wife and his kids have to take care of him and he's like no i'm the one who's supposed to be taking care of you um this happens with people who uh you know if they slip into like alzheimer's or dementia right um it, it's, it's a hard thing to go through when an ailment strikes you and all of a sudden you can't do the work you were supposed to do and now all the people who relied on you you have to rely on them so this is one of the shifting ways that we might think about Samson um, with regard to his, his idea about himself. Um, it also kind of plays on this idea of imposter syndrome. Uh, so imposter syndrome is this idea is like as we all sort of move up in life and we sort of get more and more credentials or we become a manager or, you know, professor academics deal with this stuff all the time. We're always sitting around being like, I'm not as smart as, you know, I'm trying to make people believe I am. Um, you know, Imposter syndrome is this idea for for Samsa is is now is, is he just recognizing that his life before he turned into an insect was it just all this big was he was he just being an imposter was it all just a big facade right um, so this is something that sort of wrestled around with in the book as well that's all I'm going to say for now um, these are some themes you can think about as you're reading through the Metamorphosis fill out your handout um, and we'll talk about it uh, on Friday. Okay, a couple more slides quickly. Um, Self-fulfilling prophecy is this idea that if you make positive predictions about yourself, um, the self-fulfilling prophecy of it is this idea of like speaking it into existence. Now it's not magic, right? But there is this sort of psychological trick that happens. Um, so just because I say like, I want a million dollars, I'm gonna make a million dollars, doesn't mean a million dollars magically appears. The psychological trick is if you say that you want to be a millionaire or a really good athlete, or if you, uh, want to run a marathon psychologically in connection with that means that you are probably also most likely to start behaving in ways that are going to elicit those results that you are speaking um, trying to speak into existence right so it's a little psychological trick um, you're you make predictions about yourself and then you start to model your current behavior either consciously or unconsciously towards those things so if you do go around and say things like, you know, oh, I'm never going to run a marathon. I'm not, I'm, I'm not athletic enough to run a marathon. Guess what? You're never going to train and therefore you actually never will run a marathon. However, if you tell yourself like, I could run a marathon one day, you start to get into the mindset of like, you're the type of person who could physically handle a marathon and you start behaving in certain ways with regard to eating habits and athletic training. Um, if you walk into a class, walk into college, uh, this might be an aspect of imposter syndrome might happen with freshman students they walk into college and they're like oh, i barely got into college by the skin of my teeth i'm not as smart as everybody else in the room i feel like i don't belong in this college classroom and they say i'm gonna fail this class and because they already have the mindset they're gonna fail the class and they never read and they never study um and then the the, pred the prediction comes true right so this is a combination of like imposter syndrome if you tell yourself you're not good enough you're going to behave in ways that don't meet the expectations in order to be good enough. All right. Um, so you might have experienced this you know, like your freshman year of, of college where you look around and you feel like I don't belong here. Everybody else in college is way smarter than I am. And, you know, I, I can't make it right. I feel like I kind of snuck in. All right. I don't you know, I don't feel like I belong here. You never really get there. Um, I see this sometimes with uh, with my high school athletes. Um, you know, we really try to get it in their head, like you belong here, like you're just as good as, you know, these sort of top tier uh, wrestlers in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and it is this really interesting mind shift that happens with them, usually between sophomore and junior year, where they finally get over this hump and you see just like their their whole wrestling style just changes. Because freshman, sophomore year, they're like, I'm not good enough. These guys who are elite, they're, they're so much better than me. I'm never gonna make it. And then finally they have like one big match or they like, you know, beat some guy they're not supposed to beat, or they hang in there with some team that was supposed to blow them out. And they're like, wow, like, we're, we're, we're actually pretty good at this. Like, you know, we finally are going to get over the hump. And then all of a sudden, 
you have this big shift and their entire style changes, their whole attitude changes. They start to have fun. They start to wrestle a lot harder. Um, so that's kind of what you need to do. If you want to be better at something, tell yourself that you have the ability to be better of it. You'll start training for it. You'll start, you know, engaging in the academic readings with it. Um, and you'll eventually become that person. A little bit more on self-fulfilling prophecies, uh, dress for the job you want. So there's some really interesting research out there where if you're a per if you want to start to feel like a successful person, it's like start dressing like that person. So if you come to a Zoom meeting um, in your pajamas, you're physically just going to feel more relaxed and um, not as alert. So there are some interesting uh, there's some interesting research with regard to first year medical students where they take first year medical students and they put some of them in the lab coats already. And what they find out is those students who are wearing the lab coats, who are sort of already dressing like doctors, they start to engage with the material in a more productive way, and they actually end up with better grades on their test, right? They sort of do better long term and overall um, because they feel like, um, yeah, they, they already sort of feel like doctors. All right. Uh, so if you want to be better at something, start dressing like that thing you want to be. Um, and, you know, psychologically, you'll start thinking that. Pygmalion effect, this comes from a Greek myth. Uh, this is the Greek myth over here, this painting. Um, the Pygmalion effect is that you let others' expectations of you drive your behavior, right? Uh, so, you know, my dad thinks that, I'm, that I can win, so I start to wrestle harder. My friends from high school think I'm dumb, so I don't really try in college. When you start sort of uh, ingesting what other people think about you, uh, you usually start behaving in that way um, if you, uh, yeah, depending on the type of influence you allow other people to have over you. Um, you can check out the Pygmalion effect, the Pygmalion effect, uh, just like the sort of ideas in Swan Lake. Pygmalion effect is also used in a lot of movies. Um, the movie, my fair lady sort of draws on it. So, um, if you haven't seen it, it's I think it's from 1960s, um, it's a play as well. Um, but what happens is this sort of, uh, young lower class girl, uh, in London who, you know, does not speak well, is not ladylike. There's this professor who makes a bet and he's like, I bet I can turn her into a lady uh, who can speak well and proper and get along in high society. Um, and that's, you know, kind of how the movie goes. He sort of like trains this uh, lower class, unsophisticated, you know, uh, young woman into, you know, this, you know, nice lady who can get along with the aristocrats. All right. Um, so if you allow other people's ideas about you to infest your mind, um, chances are you're going to behave in that way. So you get to tell yourself a story. Either you can do it through self-fulfilling prophecies, or you can allow other people to tell your story with regard to who you are and where you belong. All right. Last slide. You are influenced by culture, right? Culture sends you messages about what, how you can and can't act, right? Um, so culture sends you messages, right? So this is again, some uh, kind of a quasi Pygmalion effect. So if you have this cultural message that says politicians are, are old and I'm, so I'm too young to get involved in politics, that's probably going to happen. You're probably not going to get involved in politics, right, if you consume that cultural message. Um, if there's a cultural message that says, you know, all the other boys play sports and therefore I'm going to go out for a sports team, um, you're falling into sort of like gender norm cultural expectations for how you're supposed to act. So the question I want you to think about as we wrap up here is like, do you have examples of where you felt pulled into an activity or where someone else's influence, uh, someone else's opinion of you influenced your behavior, right? And if you think about it for a while, you probably do, right? And with that, you have to start thinking, you know, am I really acting this way and behaving in this way because I want to or because that's what's expected of me? That's the expectation someone else had for me. Um, am I really failing this class because I'm not smart enough or you know, do I just, do I not study at all because I'm allowing other people's ideas about, you know, my intellectual abilities to infest my mind, right? Do I have a lot of friends from high school who just say, you're not that smart. Why are you going to college, college boy? Like you're, you know, come back home. Um, if you're allowing people to do that to you, then you're allowing them to sort of dictate, uh, dictate your behaviors, which is then going to lead to failing grades in college. All right. That's all I have for the lecture, but there are three things I want to check out below. Swan Lake situation the uh, 13 minutes of the John McWhorter talk um, and uh, that Inside Higher Ed article. Just check it out real quick. All right. That's all I have. Um, next time we meet, we're going to meet live and I will see you. We'll talk about the metamorphosis.